It's Mark Thurman with the MIT Connected Things uh, group and committee and conference. And welcome back to our uh, spring summer edition, work from home edition. Our goal here with our conference, which was supposed to be March 23rd, yeah, March 23rd, is to keep the conversation going, bring in key thought leaders. Today, uh, we're very pleased we've got Dr. Jennifer Harder from the FirstNet Authority and Ed Knapp, the CTO of American Tower. And they're mostly going to talk about um, IoT, AI, ML, and it may be somewhat through the uh, lens or the frame of what's been going on with uh, all the things this summer and working from home and all that. But I want to first um, turn it over to Jen and have her introduce herself and talk a little bit about FirstNet and then over to Ed. Fantastic. Hi, everybody. My name is Jennifer Harder. I'm the Senior Director for Product over here at FirstNet at the First Responder Network Authority. So we are the government side of a public-private partnership with AT&T fielding FirstNet, which is the network that is available for public safety nationwide. Indeed, it's the only public safety broadband network that's really truly dedicated to that first responder and the communications technologies that they need. So we support your frontline public safety, your police, your fire, your emergency medical services, as well as healthcare workers and those who support them all during their daily operations and during disasters, during incidents, or during big planned events. So it's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you. And Ed? Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, Mark, for setting this up. And Jen, it's good to see you again. Um, <laughs> Hi. Uh, so I'm Ed Knapp. I'm the CTO of American Tower. Uh, American Tower is a proud sponsor of the MIT Enterprise Forum. So American Tower is um, a company that, that really provides the infrastructure that supports the FirstNet network uh, in partnership with AT&T. And I, I thought maybe we'd start with just a little bit more about FirstNet. In other words, not only who the customer base is, as you've described, but like what, what's the underlying capabilities in terms of the technologies that you use. And then maybe we can get into some of the devices and, and how the data is being captured on that network and what we can do in the future in terms of um, being more aligned with machine learning and AI and predicting things that we'd like to learn about. So with that, Jen, just maybe a couple of words on what you guys are deploying today and, and how that looks like from a customer in terms of if I'm a public safety official and I'm using a commercial off-the-shelf network. No, fantastic. So it's a really great question. First, that's the only public safety network really that's dedicated, again, for that first responder community out there. So there's lots of commercial networks that carry broadband traffic in the country today. But first, that is the nationwide public safety broadband network. So it's been built and customized and, and adjusted really to focus on that first responder use case on really what they need in order to um, effectively enable their operations. So we have priority and preemption services for public safety for all of their data, not just their voice traffic, but everything that they do. We have a lot of infrastructure being built. I know, Ed, you participated in some of that with extra towers and extra sites being added to the network specifically to accommodate public safety operational areas and places where those first responders need additional coverage. Uh, we have a lot of deployable systems that are operational on the network today that we can use to bring in um, coverage where coverage isn't normally or where coverage used to be, but something happened to it. And we're trying to make sure to sustain the network throughout that restoration process. That's been a really big thing of late, really, with a lot of these um, facilities and centers popping up that we're able to provide additional coverage for as we go through kind of the current state of things in the world. So we've been able to do a lot of those customizations, really to make sure that public safety gets what they need out of the network. Um, in terms of what we're built on, it's a 4G LTE, LTE network. Um, so we've been able to get that fielded and deployed now for a couple of years. Um, even though 5G is just starting to come out into the commercial world, what we're able to do, we're pretty proud that we're driving innovation in 5G for public safety through our participation, not only in the 3GPP standards bodies, but also in some declarations of our board that have said we have um, the authority permission to look forward to how we might be able to advance our core uh, towards 5G in the future. So really keeping an eye on what makes 5G unique for public safety, what different things they can get out of it that maybe 4G doesn't quite do as well as it could for them. Um, so we're looking a lot to the future and, and to guys like you to give us some of the innovation ideas for what's coming down the pike that they could use tomorrow. Right, now, so if we look at the 4G network today and we think about use cases, what are some of the things that, that you're seeing uh, folks take advantage of? In other words, if I have a smartphone, I have apps, in those apps, I can do a lot of things. Obviously, they have certain constraints that, that FirstNet would want to make sure 
from a security perspective. Could you give a little background on that? And then we can get into some of the devices that may be connecting instead of just people, but things, right? So when we're looking at um, the maybe asset tracking or other capabilities as far as use case, but let's start with the just the, the, the personnel themselves. What, what, what is it that they're, they're able to take advantage of now with this network uh, with a smartphone device? Yeah, so if you think about it, many of the things that you and I take advantage of on a given day are things that really public safety hasn't been able to take advantage of before because they didn't have a network that was so secured and so reliable for them that they could trust it. And the last thing you're going to do in the middle of an incident is grab that untrustworthy thing, right? The last thing you want to do is be able to lose data or have a compromise while you're trying to enable your operation. So this has kind of been a, a new up and coming for them. We're seeing them take advantage of not only commercial off the shelf kind of technologies, great uptick in things like your iPhones, your Samsung phones, your typical commercial devices, but also some more focused form factors that are really kind of public safety specific and relevant. Um, maybe that came from other verticals like mining or, or agriculture, where they had to be a little more hardened than they might be uh, around the house. I know for all of you guys who are doing a lot more work from home, your technologies are taking even more abuse than normal. My kids have gotten into mine. So it's definitely something that public safety has to think about and making sure that those devices are are rugged, they're gonna hang in there, they're not gonna break on them easily. You can use them with gloves on your hand, you can use them in compromised environments, lots of rain or heat, um, snow. You can decontaminate them for various different needs, you can clean them. So sometimes those more ruggedized devices or in some cases really rugged cases can help those devices um, really be better suited for a public safety environment. We're definitely also seeing an uptick in apps. Lots of different capabilities that public safety wants to be able to leverage out of the commercial world and I think would dream of having more customized for them. So I know we've talked about in the, in the past, Ed, some of the different agencies will go out and use real estate apps as a great way to get a sense of what's inside a building because we don't have a lot of public safety driven ways to look at the interior layout of something they're about to make entry into. So there's definitely this, those kind of capabilities out there. More and more and more we're seeing information sharing apps, collaboration apps, things that people can use to cross some divides that have always been there before and they've always had to maybe verbally share information now maybe they can push files push pictures um, get to things faster than they could so as they have more technology access they're finding all sorts of new ways to use it and i think the frontier is is still ahead of us now as they're just getting their hands on these devices and getting more used to them in their environment great it sounds like there's a lot of activity and other things that once you open it up to that marketplace but now let's if we shift gears to the the platforms themselves. So if you look at EMS, or you look at fire, or you look at say uh, the police uh, vehicles as IoT platforms, are you connecting those vehicles to the network now? Do they have other, because this becomes the beginning of an incident area, and then you might want to deploy, whether it's robots or drones, or what, what sort of surveillance, and how does the FirstNet network fit into that? Because now we're starting to get into the types of data that one could think about collecting, and for the audience here, it sort of hopefully will spin some ideas and entrepreneurs to think about how they can contribute to this ecosystem and, and further make it um, more productive and, and easier for some of our public safety folks to uh, deal with whatever comes their way, which is always a challenge every day. So how do the platforms sort of act as a hub of communication and how does that extend to sort of a internet of things around those platforms as they move about the city? And, and, and Ed, just here where there's a little jitter for everybody watching, we're, we've been diagnosing an ISP problem. These are not things running on Ed's towers, just to be very clear. Well, this is a wireline network, by the way. It's not. It's not oh, curses. That's, that's why I, I wanted to point that out. None of this stuff's running on any of your infrastructure. You're you're blameless. It's, it's a local ISP. I won't name them. He's innocent. So we talk about the vehicles, that type of thing for public safety. You can imagine most first responders spend a fairly obscene amount of time in their car. So they really do use it for all their different operations, getting to and from, and then oftentimes is the hub of their operation. So we have a lot of need to connect that vehicle for a vast majority of things they're trying to do. We pump telemedicine and telematics out of a, an EMS rig for an ambulance frequently. We always wanna know where their vehicle is. It helps us not only know where the safety of our responders is, are, are, but also, really paying attention to who's closest to a call. We're trying to reduce that call for service. So if we know that this ambulance, yeah, not their district, but they're 20 minutes closer than this other ambulance who is in their district, that may be a better deployment opportunity for us and the CAD systems can take accommodation for that. We also found though, in looking at the vehicles, 
as much as we know about vehicle operations and where those vehicles might be, we know more about that than we do our actual first responders. So, yep, they spend a lot of time in the car, but that's not where they come into contact with the public. They get out of that vehicle and they engage in an operation. And once that first responder leaves that vehicle, in big chunks of this country, we have no idea where they are. Now, they can verbally tell us over the radio, and that's fantastic. But oftentimes, if something happens to them where they cannot speak to us, they are injured, they are down, something breaks on that radio, we have no idea how to find them. So basic first responder location-based services would be a key thing that we're looking for going forward, making sure we can always find our assets, be it human or be it electronic or be it vehicle. So working on those types of things. Um, the other thing I'll say, kind of add to your question about more exotic vehicles, some of the more IoT type of things, think drones, think robots. You're seeing a proliferation of that really across the country. And FirstNet's very interested in looking at what some of those emerging use cases are, many of which have been around for a while now. It's not exactly even new anymore to use drones. But what can the network do? A lot of times um, drone operators, for example, use different frequencies to transmit their information. Would FirstNet be an opportunity for that? We're looking into some of the things we can do with our spectrum in the Band 14 area. Um, we're also looking at some big laws that are coming down the pike. Uh, the Wildfire Management Technology Advancement Act, I believe it was signed into law uh, last year in 2019, called for all wildland fires to be mapped in real time using drones carrying sensors by fire season 2020, which is now. So those types of things that we're looking for, what can we do to assist in that type of effort um, to understand those sorts of incident behaviors? We're seeing more and more of that come into the, the space every day. So Ed, I'll, I'll just jump in with a couple of quick questions if I may. Okay. So you talked about platforms and you talked about your role in terms of helping set product direction. Um, are you, or is does FirstNet set the uh, standard for the platforms uh, for usage? Do you select, uh, I won't name a specific vendor, but do you select vendor A, B, C and make them available? Do you host them on behalf of uh, a municipality or a state government or a federal agency? How does that all work? So it's a little bit more convoluted than that, but actually a little simpler. So in the public-private partnership piece of that, a lot of that work falls with our private partner. So AT&T does a lot of that work to bring the different vendors into play, evaluate those vendors, see what they're capable of, and then test them kind of against the public safety criteria that we've spoken of. We've said, hey, they need things to be highly secure. They need things to be reliable. They need things to be ruggedized in some regards, but otherwise not so ruggedized as to be incredibly expensive and absolutely impossible for public safety to be able to afford. So we've put those criteria in front of them and then they work with the vendor community to try to identify some of the best in breed that they can then bring forward to the network. The so other they interesting- They, they okay. would handle like connectivity management, Jasper Control Center and all that? All of that fun stuff. So that's been a, a nice, whew, let them take care of that, but work with them on the contractual side to make sure it's done properly. Okay. Um, the other thing that we, we like to see in this particular environment, we have a device catalog and we have an apps catalog. And we've been able to go out and work with entrepreneurs and vendors and folks that are just coming into the space for the first time to say, hey, public safety is a viable market that you can design toward. We at the authority are happy to engage with these entities. We do it sometimes through um, Public Safety Communications Research or PSER, one of our sister agencies within NTIA. And we have the recent um, R2 Accelerator Challenge or Accelerate R2 Challenge that closed that can bring some of these new entrants in, help them get up to speed and productize and be able to work with AT&T to evaluate them and bring them onto the FirstNet platform. So we're not only seeing kind of your mature guys, we're just now starting to see some of the younger, um, newer entrants into that system come up. And that's where a lot of the excitement is right now, is watching kind of the new innovation take place. Cool. Well, that, uh, so if I were an entrepreneur, and again, <sighs> Ed, Ed is a, a great sponsor of this. If I were an entrepreneur or organization that wanted to have our devices our things, our services, our whatever looked at, would we go to AT&T or would we go to FirstNet or both or either? So eventually you'll have to go through AT&T. They really have the keys to the castle with regard to getting your device safe for network and up on network or your app put through the app certification process for our catalog. But certainly we'd be interested on the authority side and talking to you to help learn more about you and to maybe help accelerate your experience in that process. But I would say right now I'm Pretty excited by some of the challenges and the opportunities that are out there. Again, PSCR, the Accelerate R2 Network Challenge with just closed. Some of those spaces are kind of the safest, best way to get 
figure it out a little bit with what you're trying to develop to get yourself in the best possible position to be able to move forward with us and with our partner. Got it. Ed, over to you. Yeah, no, so that's <laughs> that's really fantastic. Uh, thank you. I think one of the ways in which we have to look forward in the future in 5G, as you mentioned earlier, Jen, is, is that, you know, what are some of the use cases that uh, we would now have in a lower latency, higher bandwidth scenario. And then when we start to look at all these streams of data that you're starting to collect from, whether it's the, 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 the individual in the field or the vehicle or some of these other IoT platforms, how is FirstNet thinking about the back end for all of that? So, so let's maybe start with on the front end, the 5G, how does that transform what you're doing and what will happen in a 5G low latency environment? What sort of things are, are pain points that are not solved today? Yeah, great question. So a lot of what I described earlier in terms of the devices, the apps, um, IoT devices, data streams, it's fantastic. We love it. We're getting a lot more information into public safety maybe than they've ever had before. But there's a consequence to that. It's a, a wave of information that we don't have a lot of other processes in place to analyze. Um, in many departments today, it is still eyes on the screen as the way that they analyze video, for example. They really sit there and they look at that video carefully and try to, to human decipher what's in it. And as you can imagine, with hundreds or thousands of data streams coming in any given day, it's virtually impossible. So the types of machine learning that we could implement that would really help figure out what's in those videos that is salient, what's in those videos that we need to care about versus what's in those videos that we don't. So imagine traffic cams is a great example. So much of what goes on in there, I don't need someone staring at all day long. It's, it's normal rote traffic. It's not of, of importance to me. But there are certain behaviors and actions that I do need to see. And I need somehow for some entity computer wise to be able to tell me what that is. Push it out now farther toward the edge and you realize we have body cameras these days that are capable of streaming over LTE. That's great. Now you can have somebody watching your camera even when you can't see it. Maybe they can see what you as the officer are experiencing, but they're not near you. And again, they're not analyzing it near you. And that information, frankly, isn't relevant to you. You're living it. No one is, is it giving you any more information than you already have. So what can we do with some of that technology to make a little more information, a little more apparent and ready, kind of closer to where those officers are responding and not constantly having to pull it all the way back into a, a core data stream somewhere for analysis? I guess what I would say too on that front, we often think about what these videos and these data streams mean to public safety live. As often as not, it's not. What they're getting out of that is forensic. They're getting it for some sort of investigative purpose after the fact, because we don't have a, a real good way to analyze a lot of that visual data quickly enough to use it in real time. So innovations there would be a really important step forward for public safety, especially as we try to make better decisions based on some of that data that's coming in in real time. You're on mute, Ed. With respect to that data, has there been any work on, let's say, models, training models, the back end to say that you have data sets that are already pre, let's say, um, structured to be able to say that you want to map future data streams against? Is there, has there been work done in the, in the, whether it's in the public safety community or by academic uh, environments? What are some of the ways in which you can get help on, like there's a lot of deep learning models and different ways you can classify images and, and look at the back end from a learning perspective, there's supervised, there's sort of these other types of recurrent uh, networks to get certain outcomes uh, with high probability of success. Is there work ongoing to, to, or is there a, the community to help look at public safety, let's say environments, both in terms of video or even natural language processing or those types of, of sensors that might be fused together to create forensic data that would be enhancing what would be something someone would have to manually um, scan or, or, or look through. Is there work like that, that 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 the MIT and the community that comes to our conference would be able to think about um, to help with? So I think that would be fantastic work. And I know some of it's ongoing, um, but it's not something we're doing necessarily specifically at the authority. It's more something we hope to take advantage of as industry begins to bring it forward. I think one of the challenges that we have is making sure that vendors are comfortable working in that environment where that data is so critical and so salient and so important and mistakes are so problematic. And that's something that we've really had to work with talking to entrepreneurs and vendors that 
Public safety, yep, there's risk involved with working with us because we need you to be right. We need that analytic to say that that's a gun and be right about that's a gun and not have us reacting to a cell phone that the computer told us was a gun, as an example. So we, we're looking for, for folks who are really willing to, to put in the time and dedication to get it right. Um, another example, I know you mentioned kind of voice analytics and that type of thing. We're starting to see, again, in this current world, some challenges coming up. Not only is it difficult to understand people speaking different languages on a normal day um, and certainly speaking with different dialects, but now put a mask on. And we're having a difficult time understanding people. The voice cues aren't as good as they used to be. What the computers and, and sensors are used to hearing is coming out muffled. It's coming out clipped and different now. Um, certainly we have challenges with that. And if we get that wrong, potentially we provide incorrect medical treatment. Potentially we provide for a, a suspect or a victim to not understand what that officer is trying to tell them and they may behave incorrectly compared to what they were asked to do. So it's those kind of challenges that we're seeing more and more where we need the assistance. And if the electronics cannot do it properly, you're watching public safety instead of evolve and mature in technology, revert. I'm gonna go back to paper because this is too hard. I'm just gonna go ahead and call somebody who speaks that language and figure it out. You know, they're they're kind of going backward to make sure everything is is quality. And that's been a challenge that we're certainly seeing. You know, interestingly, and I'll just interject quickly, Ed, uh, at our conference and, and also on the, this page, it's hosting uh, these conversations that we're all having. We have two companies, one that is uh, in the AI business, it's analyzing emotions. And, and that's the use cases. Yeah. If somebody's in trouble, they're using video analytics. And when I spoke with uh, uh, their person, their CMO, they talked about you know, the notion of face masks when the face is covered up, you know, you, you can still discern things. And the second was a company, it's also uh, one of our keynotes, that actually tries to discern if it's a gun versus a uh, uh, a cell phone as you enter uh, a stadium or a, a classroom or whatever. So I, I think, you know, for those listening, this conference is bringing together all of these pieces and and it's, you know, you're the network element of it and the government element of it, bringing all these pieces together under one uh, virtual roof for now, hopefully a real roof in September. So I just thought I'd throw that in a little commercial for our for our conference. <laughs> well, and Mark, you, you couldn't be more right, at least in our world, everybody's coming up with these great technologies to help discern all these fun things. It's fun, or it can also be life safety and life saving. And we really appreciate right. it when anybody takes the time work their product towards something that can change somebody's life for the better. Um, we love to see that sort of thing come into play. So a lot of folks aren't sure if public safety is really the right place for their product. But if you think about it and look at it from just a slightly different angle, oftentimes you can find a great way that our first responders could use what it is you're innovating. That's right. Well, there is a high bar, right? The bar is pretty high for, you know, there's a high bar. Situation. It could be life and life or death. It, it's definitely a safety in a lot of cases. And so you know, as opposed to some commercial worlds where you just throw stuff against the wall and see what sticks. If I'm a software, we can fix it. You know, bringing that into the field is something that there's a there's an expectation of. And maybe you know, AT&T's process on the front end helps do that. But but we wouldn't want to limit the level of innovation or the ideation part of trying to try things with those who are first early adopters and have the willingness to sort of experiment, knowing that it may not be fully baked. Absolutely. But bringing us to the current environment, you know, in the new sort of lens that we look at things, are there use cases that we would want to see enabled now that folks could think about? Uh, we mentioned the mask, but, you know, from a telemedicine or a health and safety scenario on the street, are there things that, that from an IoT perspective and whether you can sense and fuse different data, are there things that, that we should be looking at as a let's say a resource community to to FirstNet, um, anything related to the current environment that would be beneficial. Um, even, you know, like you said, maybe some of the um, audio in ways that would improve it potentially. Uh, but more importantly, what about from a health perspective, what else is there that, that might be of interest? Yeah, some of the ones that we're hearing that are, uh, are new and up and coming. So certainly telemedicine has been around for a while and certainly more folks would love to take advantage of it but really had never had a reason to push that envelope. Well, we got one now. Yeah. And so we're having a lot of different folks leveraging a, a lot more of our network capabilities across the board, our network, other networks, to be able to execute that conversation with their doctors. 
that's one thing on a civilian level. It's a very different thing when you start thinking about emergency medical services and being able to have doctor eyes or advanced medical eyes on a patient that's in the field or a patient that's in a rural environment that you're going to try to transport back, but have some level of communication regarding that patient, especially for their telematics or other conversational pieces with doctors who may not even be in your area. So as different medical communities experience different levels of load, be it from a trauma, be it from an incident or some sort of mass casualty, wouldn't it be nice if the doctor two towns over who's not busy at all could weigh in and assist with that patient remotely and do that type of telemedicine opportunity. So certainly starting to see a lot more of those needs come up and a lot more of those capabilities. Um, I think we talked earlier about asset control and asset management. Exactly. In this particular type of incident, we have you know, assets moving all over the place. But the other thing to consider about is when they get cleaned, when they're again being decontaminated, how are we tracking their status through that process, whether or not they're ready for reuse, whether or not they're still down. And that's not just for medical type of equipment, that's for firefighting equipment. Every time it has to be cleaned after a fire to make sure it's not carrying cancer causing agents or other challenges. So those types of assets, making sure we know where they are, their status of operation, how quickly we can get them back into service, if it's enough, if it's not enough uh, for the next operational period and shift, that's all becoming more and more important. And again, as I mentioned before, tracking our assets that are human is, is becoming critical every day. We need to know who's in service. We need to know their status. Honestly, are they health or healthy or are they not? Um, you're seeing more and more of the wearables come into place to start watching public safety. Um, we have states in this country where you're more likely to die of a heart attack than you are to die of a bullet. And so it's one of those things of how do we make sure that those guys are the healthiest they can be and that we're watching and keeping good tabs so we're not losing our responders um, to other issues as this whole life progresses on them. So those types of, of data points are becoming more and more salient, more and more relevant. As you can imagine, every last one of them has a security concern. So what we don't wanna do is get into all of these inexpensive, unsecured technologies that are you know, cheap and easy, but maybe potentially expose that data. So we have to really balance how well we're protecting personal information, how well we're protecting health, health information and HIPAA covered information. Um, public safety sensitive and secured information. So making sure that the network that it rides is secure, making sure the technologies are secure, all of that then makes that particular type of data response viable. But at the end of the day, your use cases are commercial use cases with a, a, a you know, a public safety uh, flavor or, or wrapper around it. You know, asset tracking is asset tracking. Reverse Absolutely. forward uh, logistics as an application set on top of IoT assets. Those, that's a well-known, you know, set of uh, issues. People have been doing reverse logistics on whether it's, you know, medical devices or, you know, as you said, you know, hoses or other devices and then tracking location, tracking, you know, readiness, the state of readiness uh, for those particular items. Um, so, I mean, the good news is you're able to borrow from the commercial marketplace um, with, again, with their proper wrapper security and, and, and ruggedness and things of that nature. Are there, kind of to Ed's uh, prior questions, uh, are there things that you want that you are not seeing? Are there application areas or devices that you're looking for that you're going, hmm, if only I had a, you know, whatever, widget? If only I had a widget. That sounds like an excellent book we should write. Um, <laughs> I think some of the things that, that we see of late is honestly, and this, this doesn't always excite developers, but simplicity and consistency. A lot of folks want to be able to use something, but they want to be able to grab that thing and use it with their peers that change every day. So you may not be working with the same people you're working with on a given day because of, of, of rotations and schedules and mutual aid and, and transitions. And so some of those just basic fundamentals, you'd be surprised what's not there. So a lot of times we, we evolve ourselves or, or build something that is very, very good at what it does very narrowly and it goes very, very deep. Public safety is kind of raising their hand right now saying, hey, I need the shallow. Yeah. I just need the thing that makes all of these things doable. I don't want to have to change apps to send a picture of the kid that I'm missing. I want to just be able to send the kid. Um, those types of simplicities are getting more and more play. Um, and then again, as we talked about the wrapper, it seems maybe it's important. Maybe it's you know not to some people, but it's critical to public safety. It's got to meet their marks and their bar. I just don't want um, folks out there in the developer community to be afraid of us. 
it turns out there's a lot of ways to meet public safety's needs without having to, you know, make your device endure a fire. There's lots of other opportunities. So we can find different levels of wrapper, if that's how we want to go about it, um, to make it still a viable alternative for this community. Well, to make it friendly for, again, for the developer community, how big is the market within, to the extent that you can kind of give me, a, you know, how big is your red box? Uh, how big is the opportunity for developers within the, uh, the first net world, if you will? Oh, heavens, and now I'm going to get my numbers wrong, but it is tens of thousands of public safety agencies across the country. Um, so that's an agency level. You can imagine they all have different uh, size developer um, deployments underneath them. Right. Um, we were we were talking with New Zealand not too long ago. They have as many public safety responders in their country as we have agencies in <laughs> ours. So it's a fairly <laughs> massive number from that approach. When you start being able to multiply that by the number of individuals in an agency and then multiply that by not only your primary entities, but your extended primary entities in our world, think utilities, think tow truck drivers, snowplow operators, healthcare workers, all the different security entities and um, every other entity that can kind of come into play to help public safety, you're into the millions very, very easily. You're into the multiple millions very easily. So your, your scalability is significantly more than you might think it is if you were just thinking, you know, your police officers, your firefighters, and your paramedics. It's, it's, a, it's significantly larger than that. So it's a big market. The number I had for that, the number I had for that was about two and a half million. Was, a, was always, a, that was a TAM that we always looked at in previous businesses as far as building bespoke devices. But now that you have COTS devices and you have applications environments, it's not like there's, you know, now you have the entire cellular world to, to to work from as a starting point, and then you can make those customizations without having to do it specifically to older systems that were unique to public safety. So I think there's a much bigger opportunity. And that's only counting individuals. If you start counting devices, imagine now you're you just, up. just had of all the devices from biometrics to body cams to in-vehicle platforms to sensors all around the vehicle to all the asset tracking and you add up those things, it could be, you know, hundreds of millions of assets or devices that need connectivity. And I think it comes back to, are we providing the right level of coverage? And then are we providing the right level of capacity as a society to those, uh, from those networks to all of those devices? And that gets from, from outdoor to in building, even to some of the rural areas and other places where we, we are, we have to connect even the unconnected today, but making incident area networks that are flexible and and, and can perform um, even if they're hosted by a vehicle as opposed to by maybe a network where there may not be a network or a satellite or something like that so this is the, these are the types of things that i think make the market much bigger than than maybe just as um you know whoever uh, works in the public safety uh space and you know, Ed, you just got me a little bit with something that you said. Within range of my arms right now, I can touch four LTE devices. <laughs> so I even have it myself, just sitting at my desk, and a number of them available. Public safety is no different, right? They're having device after device and capability after capability handed to them, but they're often separate and stovepiped. If you're looking for great opportunities as a, a developer and entrepreneur, look at ways to consolidate some of these things down so that they're not having to carry the four devices I have. And if you ever doubt me on this, go take a look at your typical firefighter or your typical police officer. Find a spare inch on that poor person's body to strap yet another device. You'll see officers now with, with drop holsters down their legs carrying various different pieces of equipment because they've run out of space on their waist and their belt and, and their chest armor doesn't help anywhere else to put things. Firefighters can add 100 plus pounds with certain amounts of gear they have to carry for various different operations. We want to keep it Tight. So if you can do anything to help consolidate more capabilities into less widgets, even though we want a widget, that would certainly be a public safety boom right there. They like consolidation. So from a developer standpoint, this is really in the weeds and both of you can participate in this. Is it a different modem, different frequency than what AT&T normally has? Well, from, you know, from FirstNet's perspective, it's, it's really in the 700 megahertz. It's it's adjacent to an existing commercial band okay. and it's it's 4G and it can support both the classic 4G protocol, as I think Jen, you said earlier, and I think you could also support, I don't know if it's currently in that band, but the narrow band IoT. So some of, there's other modes that operate within the current spectrum, but there's also some 
different types of protocols that can make it easier for lower cost and um, let's say lower power, longer life devices. So that whole uh, portfolio of standardized um, technology from cellular should be available to, to the community in the first net network. So you, you would, uh, Jen, you would point developers to specific modems that you guys support or, you know, you're able to provision, you're not provisioning off the shelf stuff on your network necessarily. You're uh, making sure that they're designing with the right uh, band support. Yeah, functionally, and I can I can point certainly to AT and T for their device approval program. But basically, what happens with any type of, of item that comes onto the network, it goes through their safer network process because FirstNet users can use all of AT and T spectrum, so it has to go through all Got of it. that as well. Okay. And then they do an additional look at it to make sure that it's appropriate for FirstNet users. So FirstNet's really almost like an MVNO, a virtual network operator, in a sense, on top of AT and T's standard commercial network. With uh, uh, yeah, a little bit. We have our own dedicated separate core. Um, so we're really it's sharing the RAN more than anything okay. else, um, but we have a, a separate secured core that's different than, than the AT&T core, um, and we kind of have our band 14 dedicated spectrum where we have priority and preemption to make sure that we're always first, and then they're able to give us priority and preemption on all the rest of their spectrum to assist with that process. Um, but we have our kind of dedicated two pieces in addition to all the pieces they offer. Got it. Uh, we're nearing the end. I don't know, Ed, if you want to drop any of the our final questions i'd like i like to keep this so that we can consume he had you had a couple of good I think, questions i on think a good I one i think the questions i've uh, i'm fully i'm i'm baked here in the questions there's a lot of stuff to, i mean jen you know has done a phenomenal job responding to all of these questions i mean we covered the gamut i think in terms of technologies applications use cases even future opportunities so i think this has been a great discussion uh, i'm excited about trying to find you know, people who want to go out and energize uh, applications and devices to work in this network and support the community. So it's uh, it's been a great discussion. I, I think so too. So with that, I think I'll, I'll thank Ed. I'll thank you. You've been uh, my partner in doing these uh, kinds of things for a while. So <laughs> I, I appreciate not only this specific uh, session, which we for those uh, picking up some, some uh, chuckles, we've recorded this a few times. Just to just to get it right and get the network right. So, uh, for any of the the jitter or any of the 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 network uh, stuff, we uh, apologize. But I I believe everybody was able to hear Jen because her, her network was working flawlessly. The first net network. She preemption. She it's all about the preemption. <laughs> I caught that. And Jen, I really want to thank you as well for your uh, your insight. I have some mm -hmm. offline thoughts on creating a, a, an opportunity for uh, entrepreneurs to innovate with you guys. And uh, I, I like this notion of creating a challenge perhaps to consolidate widgets into fewer, smaller, lighter widgets. So oh, maybe it's the widget can... consolidation challenge. Yes, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll get some marketing folks together to come up with better words than that. But <sighs> I, wanna, I wanna thank you both. And I, again, I wanna thank everybody for listening and participating in, in this uh, virtual edition. And um, we hope to see you in September. Thanks again, everybody. Thanks, Thanks all. Mark. Thanks, Jen. Good seeing you.